This presentation is the first of two on the development of the pharyngeal arches. After listening to these two presentations, what we would like you to be able to do is recall the embryonic precursors that give rise to structures in the head and neck. We're going to describe these precursors and how the pharyngeal arches especially go on to form the different structures seen in the head and neck. While we have that discussion, you can keep in mind that certain congenital abnormalities can occur and you can consider how they might occur if the embryology were to be abnormal. We're also going to compare and contrast the development of the different pharyngeal pouches, clefts, arches. We'll talk about the mesoderm, the nerves to each of the pharyngeal arches, and the connective tissue. We hope that you can use this information then to figure out other congenital defects that you might see in your clinical careers. We'll first talk about the origin of the tissues that give rise to the head structures. And to do that, we need to begin our discussion with an introduction of the pharyngeal or branchial arches. The pharyngeal arches, as they're called in the human, are located on either side of the foregut. These pharyngeal arches have been termed the ancient gill bars, the branchial arches, in fish, they form the gills, but in humans, they have a different fate. And so we'll talk about the fate of the pharyngeal arches. They appear at about four to five weeks of gestation, about six to seven weeks LMP. And they're gonna go on to form the different components of the head and neck. In this little cartoon here looking at a sagittal section of the embryo. We simply want to show the developing brain and head and point out that as we look at the foregut, the beginning of the foregut, we see the location of where the pharyngeal arches will appear. Here we're looking at embryos at 27 days, 29 days, and 35 days and you can see the location of the pharyngeal arches. This would be the first arch, this is the second arch. Again, now we see the first arch, the second arch, the third arch, and a little bit of the fourth arch. If we cut the arches in a coronal section, this is what we would see. There's an arch on either side, and there are four of them. Each arch is separated from the other by a cleft on the outside. On the inside, the arches are separated from one another by a pouch. Within each arch, there is an artery, there is a nerve, and there is cartilage, along with connective tissue. So as we look at this coronal section in one of Dr. Sulik's very nice scanning electron micrographs, we can see an arch. We can see outside it is separated from other arches by a pharyngeal cleft, Inside, these are called pharyngeal pouches. If we want to consider the two together, we can call them a pharyngeal membrane. In this image down here, we're looking again at the pharyngeal pouches. We remember that each arch consists of cartilage, a blood vessel, and that blood vessel is one of the aortic arches, a cranial nerve, and some mesenchyme. As I said, each arch has its own blood supply and they're called the aortic arches. And there are six aortic arches even though there are only four pharyngeal arches. 
what happens down around the region of the fourth and sixth arch is fairly confusing. And so while we'll talk about a sixth aortic arch, we'll combine that tissue with the fourth arch tissue when we talk about development of the pharyngeal arches. Again, if we look at these arches, the outside of the arch is covered by ectoderm. The inside of the arch and the pharyngeal pouches are covered by endoderm. Inside there is this mesenchymal core. The mesenchymal cells in the pharyngeal arches uh, come from in part neural crest cells. These neural crest cells migrate into the pharyngeal arches from the developing brain regions. And they're going to help form the bones of the face and the skull, some of the cartilages, and they'll contribute to other components found in the head and neck. And we'll talk about those as we go through our discussions. If we think about the arches, which we've labeled here as pharyngeal arch 1, 2, 3, and 4, we might want to consider how these develop and how they develop in relationship to the brain structures. If we look at the brain, developing brain, there are what are called rhombomeres that we can see. Neural crest cells from these regions are going to migrate down into the pharyngeal arches. And the segmentation that we see is related to the differential expression of different Hox genes. So once again, we come back to the concept of Hox genes helping to regulate the different segments of the body, in this case, the pharyngeal arches. In addition, the neural crest cells in the head region, as I said, come from the rhombomeres. And neural crest cells from the first and second rhombomeres go to the first arch. From the fourth rhombomere, the neural crest cells will migrate to the second arch. The sixth and the seventh rhombomeres give rise to neural crest cells that migrate to the third arch. And the eighth rhombomere gives rise to neural crest cells that migrate to the fourth arch. When we consider the development of the mesoderm and the ectoderm, it's going to be important to consider different epithelial mesenchymal interactions. For example, sonic hedgehog and retinoic acid are both important in terms of regulating Hox gene expression. And in fact, deficiencies in retinoic acid can lead to problems in neural crest development along the region of the rhombomeres. And this can then lead to craniofacial anomalies. As we consider then the migration of these rhombomeres, uh, and there's these neural crest cells from the rhombomeres. What we need to consider is one of the things that is happening is the neural crest cells are going to migrate into the arches and contribute to the sensory ganglia. And they will give rise to the ganglia associated with cranial nerve 5, cranial nerve 7, cranial nerve 9, and cranial nerve 10. So each of these neurons migrates into the arch, and each arch has its own nerve supply. The first arch, then, is innervated by the fifth cranial nerve, and the neural crest cells give rise to this nerve. The second arch is innervated by the seventh cranial nerve, the third arch innervated by the ninth cranial nerve, and the fourth arch is innervated by the tenth cranial nerve. So at week five, what we see is a first arch, and there's actually two components to it that surround the opening into the foregut, and that's called the stomodium. That will develop 
in the future into the oral cavity. It is ectoderm that surrounds and lines the stomodium and the stomodium then will be all that tissue that is in front of the tonsillar fossa. The tonsillar fossa will be the gateway into the foregut which is surrounded by the pharyngeal arches. We can then talk about the fate of the different components of the pharyngeal arches and we can start off with the fate of the pharyngeal clefts. That is what happens to the clefts and the ectoderm on the outside of these pharyngeal arches. The first arch is going to develop into four prominences. There will be two maxillary prominences, two mandibular prominences. Beneath that will be the first cleft. The first cleft then is going to uh, invaginate and eventually give rise to the external auditory meatus. The first cleft is lined by ectoderm. The first and the second arches give rise to components of the external ear. The region between the second arch and the third, fourth, and the sixth arches is called the cervical sinus. The way the sinus develops is that the ectoderm from the second arch migrates downward and it will eventually fuse with, with the lower ectoderm. As it migrates down, this sinus develops. Normally, that sinus will be obliterated as the ectoderm comes in contact with itself and we'll just have then ectoderm from the second arch fusing with the ectoderm in the thoracic region. However, we can get the sinus remaining at either a cyst or if it drains to the outside as a fistula. If we look at the fate of the ectoderm, the first arch gives rise to the skin over the maxilla the mandible, a little bit around the ear, and external auditory meatus. The ectoderm is also going to give rise to salivary glands, the ameloblasts, which give rise to the enamel of the teeth, the epithelium of the buccal cavity, and the epithelium over the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. The second arch epithelium is going to give rise to, or ectoderm, is going to give rise to the epithelium over part of the external auditory meatus and a little bit of the epithelium behind the ear. The third and fourth arch ectodermal derivatives are just some of the epithelium around the ear. If we look at the fate of the pharyngeal pouches, we can talk about the development of several different structures. The first pouch is going to give rise to a tube which will come into uh, a dilated portion which will become the middle ear cavity. The tube is the auditory tube. And so if you look at the first pouch it's going to give rise to the auditory tube and to the middle ear cavity. And it's going to then come into contact with the auditory tube and the ectoderm of the auditory tube and the endoderm of the middle ear cavity together will form the coverings of the tympanic membrane. The second pouch endoderm is going to develop in the region where we have the tonsillar fossa. And so the fossa that's going to be populated by lymphocytes uh, is going to develop from the second pouch, but that lymphatic tissue enters secondarily.
The third pouch proliferates and it is going to give rise to the thymus, components of the thymus. And it starts off as an endodermal tube at about week four of development. This tube invades the mesoderm and begins to migrate downward. It then loses connection with the pharynx and over the next three weeks descends downward into the superior mediastinum. The thymus then will end up in its position detached from its origin of the third pouch. The thymus then will be populated by lymphocytes and may have other uh, components derived from other embryonic structures such as some ectoderm may migrate in there. The thymic cortical epithelium actually is derived from ectoderm. While as the current theories are that the medullary epithelium is derived from endoderm. The lymphoid tissue then infiltrates later and these are cells which will become T cells. The inferior parathyroids develop from the third pouch and again they're going to develop at about week five now, detach from the pharynx and migrate downward. And they're going to end up at the inferior pole in the back of the thyroid gland. They're going to get there at around week seven, and these will be the inferior parathyroids. So the inferior parathyroids develop from the third pouch. The superior parathyroids actually develop from the fourth pouch, and they're going to migrate downward a little later during development at about week five, detach from the pharynx, descend, and they're not going to descend as far. They're going to end up at the superior pole of the thyroid. And they'll be the superior parathyroids then. And here you can see the parathyroid tissue histologically. So the question is, where does the thyroid develop from? And if we're talking about the thyroid, it develops really as a midline diverticulum. So it is going to develop in between the first and the second arch in the midline where a foramen will form. It's called foramen cecum. And it will begin to invaginate. And if we take a sagittal section through here and look at it from the side, we would see this diverticulum. And the thyroid diverticulum is going to go down and descend in front of the pharynx. And as it descends, will form a thyroglossal duct. The thyroid gland then remains in contact with the pharynx for a short period of time. And then the duct is going to narrow. And the thyroid is going to migrate down to the region of the junction of the trachea and the larynx. Here we're showing the path of migration of the thyroid gland. In this a migration pathway, you can have remnants of thyroid tissue. And here we're looking at the thyroid histologically. The parafollicular cells of the thyroid, or the C cells that produce calcitonin, they also develop from the fourth pouch, or some people suggest the old remnant of what's called the fifth pouch. Uh, 